Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We'll get started in less than one minute. Thanks again for joining. Awesome. Hello. Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. If you would, I'm going to take a page straight from Maria's book. If you would like to put in the chat um, where you're joining us from, that'd be really cool. And Maria, one of our presenters, she, we love to see where you guys join us from. So please put it in the chat and um, we'll, get, we'll, we'll get started. So today we're going to go over how what happens to your trash and your sewage and we're going to lead with the sewage part um, primarily what we do with that sewage and how we recycle that water so before we get started a um, few things questions we love them keep them coming if you have any please use the q a feature it's located at the bottom of your screen or if you're on a mobile phone or tablet you'll find it at the top right hand corner um, if you'd like to ask your question in person, you can uh, please use the raise hand feature and we can take care of that. So we'll take questions um, at the end of the presentation. Oh, cool. We have uh, we have Bonnie from Torrance, Jeffrey from Long Beach, Hacienda Heights, Playa del Rey, Alhambra, Redondo, Manhattan Beach, Maria. It's like from all over. It's like one big L.A. County party. I love it. Yay. Um, uh, awesome. So. Um, yeah, so questions, please use the Q&A. It helps us um, keep them organized. And then, or if you want to answer it in person too, or you want to answer it live, please use the raise hand feature. We love hearing from you guys. So don't hesitate to use that. Um, and with that, oh, one other thing. Um, so we're going to start with the sewage side, the recycled water side. So after that, we're going to go over the Puna Hills landfill, the materials recovery facility to talk about our actual trash. So we're gonna take questions after this presentation. We're gonna take them up until like 940. And then we're gonna go ahead and start with the, the trash, the landfill slash materials recovery facility presentation. After that, if there are still any questions on this first presentation, we will answer them then. So this is just to kind of keep us on track and on time. So um, with that, I will hand it off to Maria. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you for spending Saturday morning with us. My name is Maria Rosales Ramirez, and I represent the Sanitation Districts of LA County. Uh, if anybody's been on this tour, great. Thank you for joining us. I hope that you find some new material today. Uh, and if you haven't, also great. I'm here to share with you guys some really cool things. So as Genesis mentioned, today we're going to give you guys the triple tour. Buena Hills, uh, the San Jose Creek Water Reclamation Plant, Buena Hills, Landfill and Materials Recovery Facility. Today, I'll be doing the San Jose Creek Water Reclamation Plant. So let's get started. Uh, bef you know, to start, I guess, we need to set the stage. Wh how, how was sewage managed and how did recycling, water recycling come about? And what's important to remember is that the, things that the way things are today wasn't always the way they always were. Um, it was very common in the olden days to go ahead and just collect sewage and discharge it straight into the ocean. So this picture is from the Santa Monica Bay where the sewage was you know, put out there. And you know, people, obviously it started at one point started uh, demanding more of their local government. So they came to the LA County Board of Supervisors and said, this needs to stop to protect public health and the environment. So that's why the sanitation districts of uh, was created, the Los Angeles County Sanitation Districts. The law was passed in 1993. That's where our agency was created, specifically to collect and manage sewage 
for LA County kind of outside of city of LA. This is a, a map that shows our current service area and you can see it stretches as far north as the Antelope Valley in the northern part of the county, all the way to Santa Clarita Valley, a little tiny bit of Malibu over here, the PV Peninsula and all the way uh, east to our county line on, on the east side. So we serve 5.5 million people over 78 cities. Um, we are very, very proud of what we do and we are happy to share with you what we do. Uh, if you notice though, we have this little marker right here on this facility, San Jose Creek. That's the facility that we're gonna tour today, but we actually have 10 other facilities all around so, you know, serving LA County. That, that handle the waste for the specific areas right here. And combined, we treat around 400 million gallons uh, of water a day. Just to put things into perspective, the average person uses around 70, 65 to 80 gallons a day. That's around four bathtubs full of water. So the fact that we process 400 million gallons, it's a lot of water. And, and we do that every day because the sewage never stops flowing. I want you guys uh, to remember that. So how do we do that? Let's get started. Uh, specific to Santa Jose Creek service area, this is one of our largest water recycle water reclamation plants. And you can see the service area here. I saw some folks from Alhambra. I think you guys are here. Your, your sewage may be coming. Oh, you're not, sorry. Never mind. Some of the people that I saw were um, coming from outside our service area, but that's okay. We still love you. We are so still in our service area. Shout out to the person from the UK who's actually joining us from here. You're a little too far our service area, but we're so happy to see you here. But the important thing to notice here is all the way from La Cañada, all the way up to like the Pomona area, uh, even for the Puente Hills. That's just because all our, all our, all our um, the, sewage are, the sewage from your homes and businesses is connected. It comes to us from our sewers. So let's learn a little bit more about our sewers. I believe the sewers are very important. I believe they don't get a lot of love. So that's why I'm happy to show you guys our pipe display garden. If we were here in person, we would have started our tour here. So let's see what our pipe display garden is. Uh, really, it's, you know, it's a wonderful addition to our facility. It's a display of the different kinds of sewers that we, the sewers, material sizes, shapes that, that are um, underground. And because they're underground, we don't really get to see them too often. But when we walk here, we just explain, look how big our sewers are. This is how much sewage or how big the pipes have to be to convey, be able to convey the sewage. Um, starting here, we have a really big plant, uh, pipe. This is a fiberglass, uh, a fiberglass uh, material, which is some of the newer stuff that we use. I like this one right here a lot. Let me show you. This is a reinforced concrete with rebar. And I, it sounds weird. This was actually part of a bulkhead. So this was actually in use. And the reason I'm showing you guys this is because sewage is not just, it just doesn't just flow. It actually, you know, it's, it's, it does something inside the sewers. And, you know, this is, a, this is a really close up look into what we do. Let me just forward it a tiny bit more. This is what I wanted to show you guys. Uh, this is actually the crown. So picture this upside down. And this is what happened. This is how sewers over time can deteriorate if they're not well taken care of. This pipe was obviously replaced. And um, I think for us, it's important to know how the sewers need, need maintenance and needs care. And this is what we do. We have a dedicated department to doing that. I'm just gonna speed this a little bit more just to show you guys some pipes. This is another reinforced uh, fiber pipe right here. Uh, vitrified clay pipe, which is one of the older pipes. If your house is from like the 1950s, it probably has that pipe. Here's another concrete pipe right here and a steel pipe. So now we see the different sizes. If you're familiar with the pipes from your home, you know, they're probably a lot, lot smaller. Our sewers are what we call the trunk sewers because they collect the sewage from the different, um, from different cities and they kind of meet. So picture, you know, city streets, they're small and then the larger streets are, are you know, have more traffic. That's kind of like the, how the sewers are for us. So let's move on. So let's see, we would have been here in person and you guys would have parked here and we would have walked down some steps right here. We would have walked this way to the, to the uh, display garden, which is right in this corner over here. And then we would have started walking this way through our facility. I just saved you guys some steps and we would have started our tour pretty much right here. Now, and we're gonna be actually, oops, 
sorry guys, we're gonna be walking and seeing what happens here at San Jose Creek. The water reclamation treatment process here is split into three stages, primary, secondary, and tertiary. So we're gonna be walking through different steps. Um, this process right here, it's, it's very standard, very typical to how water is, is cleaned, processed. Um, but it really mimics what happens out in nature. We're just doing it faster because we have to keep up, you know, we, Mother Nature needs some help. So we're doing this faster and in a shorter amount of time. So let's get started. The first thing, this is a schematic of our, of our process. It's, you know, we are engineers, we need to share this. But what I want you guys to take away is that the sewers are all the way down here because the water, the sewers flow by gravity. But our facilities are way up here. So step one, is to pump the water up to ground level because we're actually 30 feet below ground. So we got to pump the water up and that's what happens in this little building right here. It's called the influent pump building. We have four pumps that lift the water up to ground level. And then this is where we start our sedimentation, our, our first step, which is primary. Primary treatment is sedimentation, which is really letting gravity do what gravity does best, which is letting things, so heavier things sink to the bottom and lighter things float to the top. So if we were walking, we would have been walking along these tanks. They're around 300 feet in, uh, in length. Uh, note that they're covered. That is so that the odor is not a nuisance to our, to our neighbors. Um, but the, the water is here for around two hours, letting it settle very, very, very slowly. So we would have walked through this right here. And then as we get here to the end, I would have asked you guys if you guys want me to open the lid so you guys can see what kind of what like the sewage looks like. Um, and some, so some of you would have said yes, and some of you would have said no, but I still do it anyways. And that's what we're gonna do here right now. We're gonna pop that lid. And this is when you guys are, uh, should be happy that this is a virtual tour. So we're gonna, let's pop that lid open and the gimbal goes in there. I didn't stick my head in there, but what we see is just, this is what sewage looks like. Now I was a little disappointed myself to see it didn't look in its true, true, uh, you know, kind of glory, but notice it looks like murky water, like brownish, greenish, murky water. And there is some sedimentation, some solids that kind of build up. So this is actually more like what it looks like. We see, um, this is the kind of stuff that kind of gets pulled out. And that's why we like this picture. When I took the, when I took, when I went there, it just, it just didn't happen to look that way. What I want you guys to learn from here is that toilets are not trash cans. We see a lot of uh, wrappers, labels, uh, feminine hygiene products, gloves, masks, uh, but that stuff has a place to go and it's not, the, it's not the toilet, it is actually in the trash can. So I want you guys to walk away with remembering to only flush the three P's um, because this stuff can get into the sewers um, our, our pumping plants need routine maintenance. And this is a picture that my friend David over here sent me. This is an 80 pound rag ball of hair wipes, rags, masks, dental floss, all that stuff. And that stuff shouldn't belong in here. So for you guys to, yes, uh, to someone Rick said, what about wipes? Not in the toilet. Okay, I'm gonna give you guys a little talk about that right now. What only belongs in the toilet are the three P's, pee, poo, and toilet paper. Um, anything other than that can really mess with our system. It can clog the system. It can clog your pipes. You don't want that either, right? Imagine us, we're responsible for lots of pipes. You definitely don't want this in your house. There are products that are labeled flushable. And I have to say that is mostly a, a marketing term. If it's just because you can fit through the toilet, it doesn't mean that it really belongs in the toilet. It won't decompose. When we saw this, the when we lifted the lid, we see how everything kind of falls apart. If these wipes don't fall apart, they're kind of, they're considered debris and they shouldn't belong in there. So if we were looking this, I like this schematic because it shows us how it would look underneath the tanks. And what we see is that we have a system of flight and chains that pull these boards around the tank and they scoop everything to the bottom of the tank. Anything that's heavier than water, we call that sludge. We scoop it up, you don't throw it away. There is, you know, that has some value. Um, and then on the top of the part, anything that's lighter than water, fats, oils, maybe a little bit of plastics, that's called a scum and it puts that some, something away. What we want is the water in this middle area to, because it's a lot more cleaner, it, it removes about 60% of the pollution. Now, from that's what we call primary treatment. Again, that's only two hours, but now we move on to like the true start of the, the process, which is secondary treatment. This is a biological process where we use bacteria to be able to um, 
eat the dissolved solids in the in the um, in the in the water. And we have multiple channels. If you've ever been to one of our tours, you would be we would be walking through these, and we would be wondering why it's brown, why is it bubbly, what's going on. Um, this is what we call uh, the aeration process. What we're doing here is we have introduced bacteria to consume the dissolved con the organic content, the carbon in the in the sewage, which is present. And in order to be able to nourish the bacteria, we introduce oxygen. And that's, we do that via bubbles that we push from the bottom of the tank going up. So that's why you see all the bubbles. The bacteria, they don't, you know, their home, they live in like a sludge, a mud that's naturally brown. So that's why this looks a lot darker brown than what we saw the clear um, sewage. Um, and we would be walking through here, you would be, you know, hearing the bubbles. Um, I want you guys to notice that these channels right here, like you notice these are bubbly, but this one's not. By controlling the oxygen, we control the amount of the, the kind of bacteria that we are, uh, the kind of bacteria that we produce in these tanks and therefore con uh, target the, the, the specific compound that we wanna cancel. So we are introducing lots of bacteria with oxygen. Those bacteria will be targeting carbon. This is an aer uh, aerobic system, but by reducing the oxygen or putting the oxygen at very low levels, now we have anaerobic bacteria or anoxic zones, and now we're targeting nitrogen. So this is consuming nitrogen. As you can see, we have lots of channels and different bays. You see, we can see we have, you know, we have, I think in total 30. The water doesn't just flow from right to left. It actually goes every four channels. So it kind of segments, zigzags, all across the base, every four channels is one reactor, really. And the water flows here in four to six hours. So it, the, the point here is that they're doing something. And I just waved bye to the bubbles because I was, I was going to say bye. But uh, the water is here four to six hours. And this is actually a true way that we're able to handle the high flows that we have in such a small compact area. I don't know if you guys uh, picked up on that. But the, the secondary treatment is actually a two-step process. Oh, I love this slide. This is just actually a close-up of the bacteria or the, the bacteria that actually do this for us. I know that bacteria get, they don't get a lot of love, you know, COVID, flus and bacteria, you know, kind of give it a bad rep, but they're here, they're doing a, something good for the environment. So we want to make sure that, um, you know, that's just, it's part of life. This is what they do for us. But once they've done their job, we thank them and now they have to move on. So step two of our secondary treatment is removing the bacteria. And we do this in our secondary clarifier. So if, as we keep walking, we would be you know, straight from our reactors. We just keep walking and we notice the water. Um, I want you guys to see just by removing the, the, the bacteria and the sludge by stopping the bubbles, you can see how much clearer the water is. Um, again, the, the mixed liquor, the sludge where the bacteria live, is so much heavier that it will just sink to the bottom. So what happens here in the secondary clarifiers is we're just skimming the water from the top. All right, I'm not gonna lie to you guys. There's a lot of ducks that come and hang out and we, we were here, we would be seeing the ducks themselves. And actually that's part of why I, I, I like this store because um, the ducks were here when I showed up um, and now they leave. But don't worry guys, it, has, it doesn't really affect the the water treatment process so as we're walking here now we're coming to the weirs and again you're picking up the water just from the top to separate it from the sludge at the bottom and that water now is you know has gone full what we would call full secondary treatment the water is here for another about two hours but you can just you can see the bottom of the tank so you can already notice how much cleaner it already is at this stage, the water is ready to, it's actually clean. It could be discharged into the ocean, but this, this, that would make it a water treatment facility. And this facility, San Jose Creek, is a water reclamation plant. So we are going to treat this furthermore to be able to reuse it. So let's go there. Um, if I was to walk straight back here, back here by this little flag, we would, we would arrive at our filters. If anybody has a Brita, ah, if anybody has a Brita filter at home, um, you know that you would put your water in a pitcher and the water trickles down. That's exactly what's happening here. It's just a larger, a larger, uh, very large filter, Brita filter. You see the water is being discharged and it goes down through the bottom right here into our, 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 our media. Now you're wondering why does it look dark? That's because our, 
our filters are actually composed of three medias. They have anthracite, coal, sand, and gravel, and the anthracite coal looks dark. So that's what you're seeing from the top. Here, the water is cleaned even further. And it's, you know, it goes in from the top and it comes out from the bottom. There's a pipe we can't quite see in. Now, this is similar. I've mentioned this is similar to what happens in, out in nature in a river. As the water, the river, the water just doesn't flow laterally down the river. It also sinks into the riverbed and the soil cleans it. So this is, this is a mimics that as well. And from there, uh, we move on to disinfection. So at this point, I think I, I apologize. I forgot to mention. Um, we would be in tertiary treatment. So filtration and disinfection is tertiary treatment. So let's look at that. Disinfection, like anything else, um, you know, we, we want to make sure the water is free of any, any, any bacteria just in case. So these are what we call our chlorination tanks. We have two large channels. They're about 600 feet long and the water's here for around two hours. So we add chlorine, similar to at home, we use it to disinfect. Um, we would be walking alongside here. And when you're here, you would get definitely that, that chlorine smell. You can count and smell it. Uh, when you add chlorine, there's, there's a thing called res chlorine residual time, meaning that you just don't add it and walk away. The chlorine has to have like move through the water to, to be able to act. And that's why we have this 600 feet uh, long channels uh, of disinfection. Now, at this point, if the water is going to be uh, distributed for reuse, it would stay chlorinated. But if it's going out into a, a, a river or a local, like a, a river or a channel, which in this case, some of it is, the chlorine will get removed. So there's no uh, adverse effect to nature. So now we've come to the last part of our San Jose Creek, and this would be the end point of our tour. I'm just gonna turn around a little bit so you guys can see how far we walked. You guys must be tired. Let's look. Let's look back all we came from all the way over there to all the way over here. So at this point in our tours here, chlorination tanks are right here. Um, I what we usually do in our tour is we lower a beak into the channel to show you guys how clean the water is. You guys saw it at the sedimentation tanks, how, how green and kind of murky it was. But here it is, the moment of truth, our recycled water. Ta da! In 10 to 14 hours, our water now looks like this. Feel free to put an applause in the chat if you want to. And here's a close up in slow motion. You could see all that water. The best part of this water is that it is now a resource for us in a local resource. And this is where we take our narrative to the next step. This is not just about cleaning sewage, this is about making this water a resource for, uh, for, for our area, for LA County. So right behind, let me just point this out. Right behind here, right on this side right here, is our manifold, that our, our outfall. You can see how clear the water is. This is where it looks like if you've been to arranging water so to the pool, you get that kind of feel. And from here, our water is distributed uh, locally for reuse. From San Jose, I'm gonna replay it again. Thank you guys for the love and the clapping. Um, from here, the water is distributed to over 135 sites around close to San Jose Creek to Whitt in Whittier. So some of the local, some of the users you might be familiar with, with is Rose Hill Cemetery. Um, uh, also the California Golf Club, which is right next door to us. So the, um, I can, street medians, every time you see the purple pipe, that's used, that's ground, that's recycled water that's being used. But what about the other side of the water? We also support habitats. And if we were in our tour, we would have walked over to the edge to the San Jose Creek, which is our little neighbor right here. That's why our facility is called the San Jose Creek. And I love this shot. This is when the water is discharged into the San Jose Creek. And I had to pay that little bird extra just to fly in the frame. Um, look how beautiful it is. And we're gonna take a look at the water, how it supports the habitat in the San Jose, the San Jose Creek. The, the camera is gonna pan out just a little bit there we go and from here it would go, flow to the river and eventually make it to the uh St. Gabriel uh the recharge basin it's pretty cool huh so where does our recycled water go it, uh, it augments our local water supply uh recycled water is very important because instead of having to buy imported water potable water for for human consumption we can use our recycled water for other purposes so we're not buying, you know, recycled water is probably about a third of potable water, so you're spending less. It's, a, it's actually a good thing. And it's local. You also avoid the cost of transporting that water over. Our recycling water program dates back to 1962, 
which we were, you know, doing that way before, you know, it got cool to recycle. We were doing that way back then. And to date, we have recycled over a trillion gallons of, of water, which is a massive amount. That's probably the equivalent of a 12 foot pipe from here to the moon full of water. That's amazing. Um, over time, the, 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 the use, the sites that want to use recycled water has grown and we're really close to hitting a thousand sites from our program overall, not just from San Jose Creek. Some of the uses include agriculture. I pointed in our map how we have some uh, sites up in the Antelope Valley. They use it to water fodder crops. That's a uh, crop for cattle. That's what they're doing here. Uh, we also have industries, any textile or any kind of industry that uses uh, steam or water as part of their industrial process, they can use the recycled water. We usually use it for landscaping. That's probably the most popular one that you've seen. Anytime you see a purple pipe in a park, a golf course or school, the street medians, the freeway, um, that's using recycled water. And depending on where you live, it can be water from our facility. Um, and groundwater recharge. I'm gonna talk about that one in one slide. So let me just put a little pin on that one. And our last use is environmental. So we actually sustain natural habitats up in Lank in, in um, the Antelope Valley, if you're familiar with Paiute Ponds, we have uh, you know the local water from those local water treatment plants help sustain the, the 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 nature habitats there. So the reason I moved groundwater research to the end is because it's actually the largest use of our recycled water. And this right here, if it wants to cooperate, it doesn't. Let me start it again. Is one of uh, the spreading basins that we work with in partnership with. Uh, the U.S. Army Corps and other agencies as well. So if anybody's familiar with the area, this would be kind of by like between in Pico, like south of Beverly, you notice these ponds that are kind of like dips in the grass. Um, these are recharge basins. And this is very important because this is a way we're actually able to store the water for future use. Uh, the water table here is very, very shallow. So uh, so it's very high up, I mean, so that when we put the water here, it really soaks into the ground. And then again, it goes through what Mother Nature would, would do. So we're actually helping Mother Nature replenish the water supplies. And again, this is the way we've been, you know, recycling water since 1962. Um, if you, there's a bike path right here. So if anybody's used, oh, right here. If anybody's ever used the bike path, this is, would be what the water is for. And again, we're very proud to be able to be, uh, contribute this, um, especially now that we're in a drought where we're happy to be able to help with water recycling and point out to people how water recycling is important because recycled water is important to our quality of life. I love this picture because it shows us um, the facility. It shows us the San Jose Creek, which I showed you, the outfalls right here. And it also shows you the, Gal the California golf course, which is using the recycled water to maintain uh, the lawn screen. And I, I think this kind of captures, I don't know, the science, the habitat, and the need, this, the technology to help us manage our water. So with that, I thank you. I'm going to stop screen sharing and um, let's get ready for some questions. Genesis, are you there? Yay. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. So let's jump right into it because um, we have 13 minutes. All right. So let's go to our first. Well, first, let me say Polly from the UK. He said, I'm here as a fan of Bixby's online nature walks. Yay! I Thank so, you. Oh, thank a you. Little, like teardrop. Yeah. I did. I feel that. I feel that. I missed them too. Um, okay. So, first question from Gregory. Um, Actually, sorry, from, but he was interested in the tertiary, but we went over the tertiary. Okay. Um, so are there any plans for reusing the amount of water, for increasing the amount of water reuse in the county? Uh, yes, so there are multiple projects that we're involved with to be able to provide more water recycling. I'll mention two very briefly right now one local and one regional. So the San Jose Creek water, uh, water Reclamation Plan actually just completed a project we, we called Flow Equalization, which is a project that to be able to stabilize the flows so that we have more uh, recycled water available, a consistent amount throughout the day. And I'll explain why. Um, most of the water that comes to us is when the people are using the restrooms or cooking. So that's during the daytime. But if our water is mostly used for, let's say, landscaping, 
you're not going to water the parks when the people are there. You're going to water the parks or the golf courses at night. But at night is when there's less water. So by having the flow equalization process, we're able to hold on to that water during peak times in the day and uh, treat it at night and release it at night so that it can be reused. So that's one way, like I, I would say it's an immediate way we're providing more water. On a bigger sense, we also have a great project that's called the, Re we're partners with the Regional Recycled Water Project. That's a partnership with Metropolitan Water District, who's the wholesaler for water for many counties in Southern California, so not just LA County. And the project here is taking our last facility that currently does not recycle water, but will be recycling water and uh, sending that water out regionally to be, to be used throughout LA County. So that would be a way to provide even more recycled water. Genesis, if you get a chance, can you put the website uh, on the link so any, yeah. any friends can read up more on that? So then again, that's a great, exciting project. And I think it's a way that it, it like furthers our mission. Now we're, we're helping people with more. So I think it's a great way to provide more recycled water. Uh, next question, Genesis. Um, is this water considered safe for potable use? Yes, so this water actually feeds drinking standards. The law currently does not you know, allow us to drink it water, but nothing will happen if you drink it or if it touches you. Uh, there are plans, I mean, it, the truth is at this point, this water can be put into the groundwater. It's, it's put into groundwater, right? Into the, the, the recharge basins and eventually further down stream many years later it can be picked up as a drinking water supply uh next question awesome um also is it current you almost kind of answer is it currently going into our homes like for residential use uh it is not directly going into residential use right now because we are only we only treat the water and provide the treatment your water is actually managed by your your water um, your water provider who your city picks so wherever their source is. Now, indirectly, it could happen where this water gets into the ground and it's stored in there and maybe it gets picked up way downstream. It, again, it really depends on where your local water supply is, but for the most part, it would get cleaned as it's in the ground. And then when it gets pulled up again, it, get, it goes through the normal water, tr water treatment process. It, does just, does, it doesn't go directly into your, um, into your, to your homes. Okay, great. And then the next question, um, what can we do to stop manufacturers from using the term flushable? Excellent question. Um, so like I mentioned, this was a manufacturing term and actually in October of last year, there was a Senate bill AB 818, which required manufacturers to provide clear and consistent, con consistent uh, labels that say that a, a product is not flushable. And I really kick myself in the foot right now because I wish I could share that with you guys right now. But the point is that um, there, was no, there was no standards, there was no uniformity, people could put whatever you want. But now they're, going forward, there will be a label. It's actually a little, it's a little person putting like something in the toilet, like throwing something in there and it has a, like a line going over it. And again, that indicates that they will not, these products are not meant to be in the thrown in in the in down the toilet. It's, it's not just flushable wipes, by the way. Um, it also could apply to disinfecting wipes. You know, everybody's cleaning everything because of COVID or just in regular. It could be baby wipes or personal hygiene products. It could be makeup wipes. So it's, it goes beyond just a flushable wipe. Uh, next question. Awesome. And we have a few minutes left before we go into our next portion of the tour so make sure to stay tuned all right so next um next question can you further elaborate what happens to the organic solids yes i do apologize for that so right now the story only followed the water but the sludge the solids left over through the what through the water reclamation process actually go down to our facility in carson where they're even a uh, short story they actually um processed and they produce two things. One is green energy, they're stored in digesters and the decomposition produces a gas that we call the digester gas that has a methane, which has heating value and we produce electricity down in Carson. We also, so that kind of follows one part and then the leftovers from that, the residuals from that is actually used to make a fertilizer and compost, which is we do in our facility up in Kings County and in Fontan. All right, next question. Um, is there a plan to collect rainwater? 
rainwater. Okay, so that would be stormwater. And that's actually upon every single uh, city. Okay, let me back up a little bit. That's actually up to your city to manage. Uh, here in LA, our systems are separate. So stormwater is separate from, from sanitation or from sewers. There's a little bit of crossover. However, there, there are other cities where it's a combined sewer, combined, combined stormwater, like rainwater and sewage. LA County doesn't have that. Um, but I am happy to say that our, our laws were enacted in 2016, I believe, 2015, to be able to, for the sanitation districts to help cities manage their stormwater and their rainwater. Um, they're actually, our first project is Carriage Crest, which is in the city of Carson. If you've ever seen the park on Figueroa and Sepulveda, they're capturing a lot of the recycle, the rainwater there, and they're sending it for treatment, uh, pre-treatment, and then to our joint water pollution control plant, which is right across from Bixby for, from our friend from, from the UK. Oh, cool. All right, so um, next question. How does the odor from the primary process impact the local area? Well, you saw that the tanks are covered and that's very specific to prevent odor. So there isn't much in the way of odors. Everything's kind of been, been closely, uh, it's, it's covered. And that's actually for all of our facilities here in, in like in the LA uh, area, they're all covered. It is not always the case. If we went up to our facilities up in the Antelope Valley, uh, they are actually out in the open because the land use around there is actually very different from here. So we do work with uh, homeowners. Or we actually have a, a phone number that you can call, and maybe we can find it and put it on our on the on the chat for people if there's if there's ever been an, an issue. But for the most part, we haven't heard anything. We do have we are mostly surrounded by the freeways, the 605 and the 60, but we do have some neighbors. There are quite quite a way though. All right. Um... Thank you. Are the flushable wipes considered trash to your facility, like plastic wrappers and such? Yes. Perfect. I'm going to stand up for everybody, for all wastewater treatment facilities and say yes. Okay, great. Um, <clears throat> so next one, is this the facility where the health department can test for the amount of COVID in the area? Oh my god. Are gosh. those tests done closer to the source of the sewage? Well, okay, so do, uh, we are doing what well, that's called uh, wastewater surveillance. We're monitoring COVID in the wastewater and uh, when we started the program, San Jose Creek was one of the facilities that we were testing. However, but our program was actually continues in Carson. So we have a larger, our largest water treatment plant in Carson. Um, that's where our, our current COVID, COVID study is taking uh, the samples from. Awesome, I knew you would love that question. I do. All right. <laughs> Put a link to our, to our COVID study on the chat if you can. Oh yeah, I will, I'll do that. Okay, awesome. thank you. All right, so next question. Um, Oh, this is a little, little tricky. All right. If there is an earthquake or cyber attack knocked out the power grid, what effect would that have on the water treatment system? And would the sewer system continue to function? Well, our power plant or our wastewater or our water, any facility that we have has to have redundant systems in place. So we do have generators on site that could carry the system moving forward. So we could, so the pumps and the, the oxygenation that the aeration part, the making of the bubbles, that's what consumes the most power so that our facility could keep going. So if there's a, if there's a power outage, the generator's going like, um, the, the sewers can temporarily serve a storage for the for sewage before it gets to our plant. But then at that point, I, we, and then I will mention that at one point we did have a problem with one of our pump, our facilities a long time ago. So then we set up bypasses. Actually, we had cars that would take pumps and route the, the sewage elsewhere. And I would imagine that would be something if, if, if it needed to be done. All right, wow, we're not gonna do that. Okay. All right, um, we still got time. Okay, so- I'm coming. Do you, do you um, I understand hormones and drugs do not get removed in the wastewater mm -hmm. treatment. What effects do they have when they are released into the environment in the recycled water? Well, we are, okay, so when we talked, when we did our tour here, what I didn't get to a chance to show was that we do have our laboratory that's consistently testing for all this. And the the truth is that it's not, um, that we are working, we are studying this actively, but uh, we haven't seen that um, in our water. And actually, I actually invite you guys to come to our ocean monitoring tour. It's actually gonna happen July 16th. Um, Genesis, if you can put a link to the flyer, uh, yeah. that actually could cover a lot of how we're actually monitoring the, the waters in the ocean. So this is what we call the receiving waters. Um, if there's any questions, I don't know if there's 
Basil, if you're there, if there's anything you want to add. Um, I think you covered it. I mean, we haven't seen anything detrimental, but we're continuing to stu study yeah. and monitor the receiving waters. And as we get more information, we'll modify our operations. Correct. Thank you, Basil. Oh, who's he? I would like to introduce my boss and friend, uh, Basil Hewitt, who knows everything about the district. So make sure you ask him all the hard questions in the upcoming tour. <laughs> He's also our lifeline, too. That's, all the hard questions. True. All the hard I questions. Know. Maria knows everything about the district. Okay. All right. Well, we'll stop that right now. Okay. Okay. So, uh, last question. Da -da -da -da. All right. Um, wow, this is getting very hard to choose. Um, and then keep in mind, we will answer any, there's only a few left that we don't have answered. We will answer them at the end of uh, yeah. our next presentation, which Basil will do. All right. So, um, is there potential for systems like this to address the drought on a larger scale? I think it was a reference to the regional recycled water program. Right. So I'm gonna let me see. Hold on. I'm gonna share my screen again only because I want to go back to an earlier, um, an earlier. Well, hold on. An earlier little map that I have. Genesis, can you see my screen? Yeah, I can. Okay. Sorry, let's back up because I really want to show you. Almost there, guys. Hold on. Okay, so here's our service area, and we have facilities just like San Jose Creek, all the way up in Lancaster, Palmdale, La Cañada, Valencia, Saugus, Long Beach, Los Coyotes. So we are already recycling water in these in these in these facilities already, and it's going local to those areas. What we didn't show here, though, was that the, the facilities here in this in this um, area right here, so it excludes the Antelope Valley and, and, and Santa Clarita, are connected by, with trunks, sewer trunks, large trunks. And that's how all the water comes down to the joint plant. That's how the solids are, camp, are, 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 are treated. Um, but what we're doing here is we're setting up the water so the water is being recycled and reused. Like I said, mentioned what we call upstream. Now here at the joint plant, this is the facility where we're currently discharging to the ocean, the water, it's cleaned, but it's discharged to the ocean. And this is also where we have our, our project that I mentioned earlier, the Regional Recycled Water Program, where we would collect all the water. And I, I have to mention that the water here historically tended to be a little too, I wanna say salty for reuse. It needed further treatment. So this is where our partnership with Metropolitan kicks in. They are providing even further treatment to be able to, to, be able to uh, clean the water, recycle. And then from here, it can be reused locally and also send it out to further places, more places beyond actually our service area. So that's actually one of the cool things about this project. And again, go to the website that Genesis put for the RRWP and it explains it better. I, like I mentioned earlier, I think it's great that we're now um, recycling water, like sending out recycled water regionally, which is what we're doing with potable water. Potable, potable water is being sent out beyond its area and here we're doing that for recycled water as well. All right, awesome. Well, um, let's give it up for Maria, yay. <laughs> thank you guys, thank you for the excellent questions and thank you for the feedback. Okay, awesome. Pleasure having you. And now we're going to move right along to, to Basil. Maria promised that she wouldn't upstage him. She wouldn't do too great because, you know, we want to make sure that Basil looks good too. <laughs> all right, Basil, all you. All right. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Genesis. Thank you. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Maria is a tough act to follow. And let me uh, attempt to share my screen. And that's already a difficult trick. So Genesis, can you see my screen? Uh, yep, we can. If you can just hide those controls. I and... just did that. And Maria um, gave you um, a tour of our wastewater side, um, our most important water reclamation facility. I'm going to give you a quick tour of our solid waste side. She talked about the people we serve, about 5.5 million people over half of LA County in these different shaded areas. She mentioned the Antelope Valley. Santa Clarita and the Southern part of LA County area we call our joint outfall system. She mentioned our mission, 
created in 1923. Our mission is to protect public health and the environment through cost-effective and innovative wastewater and solid waste management. She's talked about recycled water. I'm going to talk a little bit about energy and recycled material. Um, she talked about our formation in 1923. These are the three gentlemen that really carried the water in creating sanitation district. The guy in the middle was the chairperson of the Board of Supervisors back in the early 20s. The guy on the left um, is, um, was uh, elected official from the South Bay that um, helped pass right the Sanitation District Act in Sac Sacramento that created our agency. And this guy on the right it was our first chief engineer, Albert Kendall Warren. And I love the hats they all wore back then. I think we should bring that back. Um, she mentioned we formed in 1923, Wastewater Agency. Our act was amended in 1949 to allow us to help the county, help the region manage solid waste. And the big driver was air pollution. Back then, people burned their trash in their backyard. Um, and this was a fancy backyard incinerator for a lot of folks. They just put it in drum, burned it, led to terrible air qualities. These are pictures from that era. Board of Supervisors um, said, realize this is low hanging fruit. If we can stop backyard incineration, we can improve air quality. And so our act was amended in 49 and then further amended in the late 50s to allow us to manage solid waste. We don't collect it but we, we can operate landfills and material recovery facility. Today, we manage a fifth of LA County's trash. These um, highlighted facilities are some of the facilities we have. Um, we have two active landfills, one in Calabasas, and one called Shoal Canyon near Burbank. And today we're gonna focus on the foundation of our solid waste management infrastructure. It's our Pointe Hills, um, facility, Point Hills Landfill, and the Material Recovery Facility located right near the San Jose Creek Water Reclamation Plant that Maria profiled. When we do in-person tours, typically we'll start with a, a morning tour of the treatment plant, and then uh, after that we do a bus tour of our solid waste facility. So we're going to try to give you that virtual effect. So from San Jose Creek Water Reclamation Plant, we would drive out on the bus and that mountain you see in front of you is Point of Hills Landfill. It started in 1957. We purchased, uh, purchased in 1970. We put in all these modern environmental control. It was closed in 2013. And this mountain is about 130 million tons of trash. It's the equivalent of a 50 story building. And we've vegetated it. We've tried to make it be a good neighbor. Most people drive by on the 605 or the 60. They don't even know that that once was a landfill. And we'd like to just kind of quickly give you some of the engineering behind that landfill. The way the landfill was built, uh, a lot of the areas we put down what we call a liner, then the trash is put in here, it's compacted, then it's covered with dirt at the end of the day to stop the spread of disease. We don't want um, vectors, roaches, rats, seagulls spreading things out of the landfill. So we covered at the end of the day with a layer of dirt. And as we built this up, like almost like a layer cake, we would put um, pipes, bury pipes in the into the landfill. Um, we'd also have what we call header wells. So what we're doing is pulling out that landfill gas. So as that waste is buried, we get what we call anaerobic digestion microorganisms that live in an oxygen-free environment, they start breaking down that material and producing um, CO2 and methane. And we're, we want to, you know, initially we're flaring that so it doesn't go to the atmosphere, but then we started collecting it and generating power from that. And we'll show you more about that. But this is our public service announcement. Uh, Maria talked about uh, not flushing wipes down the, the drain Part of the thing with our landfills, we've realized over the years, you know, our mission is to protect public health and the environment. And one of the most cost-effective ways is to have, is to collect household hazardous waste. So since 1988, we've had a program um, that every weekend, someplace in the county, we have these free household hazardous, hazardous waste roundup where you can drop off the stuff free of charge and then we'll process it. And Genesis, do you wanna like hype the program a little bit? 
<laughs> Let's see. I thought you would never ask. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay. So yes, you could take fluorescent light bulbs, batteries, paints. Um, what else? What else? Oh, any old sharps, like sharps that you've already used and any pharmaceuticals, like you said. Um, but we have, so upcoming for today's on, on the schedule for this month, we're in Glendora actually right now. So you can run over there right now. Actually, don't run. Wait, stay for the tour. Wait till after this. But It's after the tour, but they'll be there until 3 p.m. So right now we have an event going on in Glendora, and then we have another event going on in Calabasas uh, by the Calabasas landfill. It's like Gura Hills. Um, that will be going on tomorrow, actually, the Calabasas one. And we have Pasadena coming up, Culver City, Lawndale. I know a lot of you were joining us from that area, from the Redondo Beach area. So I'm going to put the link to our website here. It's lacsd.org slash HHW. Um, I'll put it on the chat so that you guys can just easily click on it and, and visit it. But we'll wait for after the tour. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, you it works like how you see in the picture. You drive up. And we take all that hazardous and electronic waste straight from your trunk and you can drive off and be on your way. It's like a drive through but well, I wouldn't say better, but anyway, it's like a drive through You don't get food. It, it, it is a drive through you It is a drive through but you don't get food. Oh, okay. Drive That's what you mean. Yeah. All right. Anyway, back to you. Right. Yeah. So in five, 10 minutes, we'll take it. We'll properly dispose of it. We'll recycle the heck out of it. And it, it's cost effective way of protecting the environment. So now let's look at um, part of the, when we do the bus tour, we drive up to Pointe Hills landfill. So um, Genesis and Maria drove and they didn't drive this fast. They just sped up the video. Um, but as you move from our office, that mountain straight in front of you is Pointe Hills landfill. It is a gorgeous looking mountain that we vegetated with uh, different plants. We have a, a nursery crew there, a landscaping crew and we irrigate it with recycled water. So they're not driving this fast. We just sped up the video uh, for the sake of brevity. So they wait here at the light and they're gonna make a left in here. Um, the landfill closed in 2013, but the material recovery facility op opened in 2005. So this truck that we're following, they're gonna peel off to the right and they're gonna go to the material recovery facility to uh, drop off their load. And we will do that later. But first, when we do the virtual tour and the real tour, we go to the left so you can get a, a flavor of the closed Point of Hills landfill, which um, we're now working with LA County Parks and Recreation to turn this into a, uh, into a passive park for the community. So notice they're going to the, um, the right and this truck is leaving from the Murph and then we're gonna to go to the left. When the landfill was open until 2013 and those gates weren't there, but there were scales here, trucks would come up, they would get weighed, um, pay their fee, they drive to the top, uh, drop off their load. And so what you're looking at is the closed landfill. We're always very proud, it's, it's beautiful um, in terms of the vegetation and so on. We want it to be a good neighbor. The landfill sits on about 1,350 acres, and we only use half of it for landfilling. The other half, we use, we create buffer property around the landfill. So we're driving parts where the scales used to be as we go in. And we could have sped this up even further. Um, and usually on the tours, we'll stop right here. You notice all the, the vegetation we put in. I think this is an old um, scale house when people would drive up. Um, and then as they get past this point, now they're driving on trash. And you're going to notice that. Notice how the road kind of undulates, goes up and down. And it's not because we're terrible constructors of roads. Is that they're driving on trash. And as the trash decomposes, it decomposes at different rates because the trash is not homogeneous. Maybe one area has a lot of concrete, other area has food waste. The food waste will decompose. The concrete or, or construction debris may not. So you get this up and down, um, almost like a little Disneyland ride. And so we have a maintenance crew that's always maintaining the road. Also notice the water. That's some of Maria's beautiful recycled water from San Jose Creek. We use it to irrigate the landfill. 
And as we're driving on top, and again, Maria and Genesis were not driving that fast. Disclaimer, they're doing this, this has been sped up. And I talked about how we buried the, um, we buried pipeline or um, trenches and we have pipeline in the landfill to collect that landfill gas. And here's some video. This is one of what we call the benches. So as, as it's built up almost like a layer cake on the edges, these are the roads. And so you typically wouldn't see the actual tour because the bus couldn't make it here. But this is where our maintenance crew, crew goes and they will inspect the these line, these gas collection pipeline to make sure they're still working. And what they're doing is pulling all that landfill gas out and they're taking it towards a power plant. And, and we're taking it to what we call PERG, Point of Hills Energy uh, from Gas Plant. And here's PERG itself. This was built in the 1980s. Um, this was groundbreaking. You know, everybody recognized the landfill gas was a nuisance, but it was basically carbon dioxide and methane. And methane is the same landfill gas you have coming out of your stove. So we're like, okay, if you notice, if this thing would stop for a second, that's, we're gonna pause. We're, right here are how we used to handle it. We used to just take the gas and flare it almost like a big Bunsen burner. But in the eighties, we started, we built this, this facility that would burn the landfill gas to generate electricity. And we use it to power our facility and the rest we would put, we would sell into the grid. Let's see where, how fast Maria and Genesis are driving. So you get a better shot of Perg right here. And what you're looking at the top, you know, if you're driving along the 60 and the 605, you'll notice, um, you'll notice that coming off the plant. And that's basically just steam, steam, because they're also um, turning water into steam and turning um, a, uh, another generator. And we're really proud of this facility because it's generated over a billion dollars to help keep our rates down for the folks that utilize our system. Now from there, you drive to the very tip top of the landfill. And we sped this up as well. At the very top of the landfill, this is native ground, but this is the highest point in the landfill. And, and on the bus tour, we get out and we walk. This is Genesis and Maria walking, I hope. Let's, let's play this. And so the high vantage point, if you notice to the right, um, there are benches, there's a watering trough because people have horses in the neighborhood and they'll ride their horses up here. There are different trails, a hiking trail, jogging trail, walking trail, um, part of being a good neighbor. As I mentioned, half the footprint was just buffer land. So what we've done over the years, we've donated about uh, $60 million to what we call the Point of Hills Native Habitat Authority. So we've preserved, um, they, they manage about 4,000 acres in the San Gabriel Valley, native habitat, hiking trail, and home for native species. All right, and here's the, again, the very tip top. And when this landfill closed, um, um, our, our goal, as I mentioned earlier, is um, we're still going to maintain the environmental controls, but LA County Parks and Recreation, and this is an amazing vantage point where you can see the whole San Gabriel Valley, you have a 360 degree view of everything. Um, we're going to turn it over to LA County Parks and Rec, and they're going to turn it into a passive park. We've donated, we've contributed $60 million, notice the stuff to the right for the uh, Point of Hills Native Habitat Authority. And we're gonna contribute about $80 million to build um, a passive park for the, the community to really enjoy. Here's, the, here's that, that vantage point, here's a panoramic view. This whole area at the very top of the landfill will be um, parks and rec, will landscape it, add more trails, and it'll be an amazing, amazing resource right at the 605 and 60 freeway. Okay, and we're gonna move on. Now, we're gonna go to the crown jewel of our solid waste system. So when the landfill, when landfill closed, 
the trash that comes in there, remember that truck we saw going to the right? It's going to that facility. And again, Maria and Genesis are not driving that fast. Just sped it up. That building is the Point of Hills Material Recovery Facility. So we'd come down the road, make a right. And this is what this facility looks like. It opened in 2005. It, it has, it's fully enclosed material recovery facility. It has enough room for three jumbo jets. That's over 200,000 200, square feet. So much like when the landfill is open, trucks in your neighborhood, they would collect trash and then they would decide whether they're gonna bring it there. And so they would go up to our scale, they would get weighed um, and then go into the facility. And many of you, if you've been a lot of virtual tour over the last two years, this is going into the facility, it's fully enclosed. Um, when that the trash goes in, we're trying to recycle the heck out of it. So here's some of the commodities that we pulled out that um, we're gonna um, sell on the commodities market, keep it out of landfill, generate revenues to keep our costs down. Notice that the facility also has skylights to keep our energy costs down, our light usage down. Um, and we'll get in more into the tipping floor, but when we do the real tour, we get out of the bus and we walk upstairs to this mezzanine. And this is the look from the mezzanine. Um, starting over here, this is where the recycled material goes. Stuff that can't be recycled will be over here. In the back, you'll have green waste. To the right, we collect food waste. Um, and I'll talk more about that. And notice the misters. If it gets too dusty in there, um, we'll turn on misters to keep the dust down. And there's a, um, one of our employees right here that's kind of traffic control. Smaller loads will go to the right, larger loads will go here, and just making sure everything, like the traffic cop. So here's a large load being um, uh, offloaded. Um, this is a uh, this truck main um, vehicle mainly has recycled material. This is the stuff in the blue bin. You know, we don't we don't pick up the trash. Your hauler decides whether they're going to utilize the facility. We're there as a backstop to create a cost effective place for trash to be managed. Um, if you're a do it yourselfer, where you have a, a let's say a tree in your backyard, you want to cut down or remodel a um, a room. And you, you can also come to our landfill. You pay the tipping fee or to the MRF tipping fee about 70, 75 bucks a ton and just um, and off your load your, your material there. We try to keep the hand load separate from the big trucks. We also get yard waste that is composted offsite. So part of our mission is um, not just to protect public health and the environment, but we wanted turn waste into a resource. Everything that comes in there, we're looking at how can we reuse it? How, what, what value does it have? Here's recyclable before they're being bailed. And most of the recyclables in California, in the US, in Europe, it's shipped overseas, mainly to Pacific Rim countries. And those countries over the last eight to 10 years have been tightening their standards because the, um, the bailed material wasn't as pure as they would like. So as they were toughening their standard, it was harder to get our, re our commodity and everyone, every state, every country to get their recycled commodity back to the Pacific Rim country. So a couple of years ago, we installed an automated sorting line that you see here and Genesis put together this cool Benny Hill, Willy Wonka type video showing this automated sorting line. It creates ultra pure bales and it, it's, it, its throughput is like four times faster than what we had before with the system. And I'll step you through that um, pretty quickly um, in terms of how this system works. And you see these ultra pure bales that have been created. So the, the recycled material, the stuff in the bag comes in, we break it. From there, we, what you don't see here, we have a room that we pull out large things that may jam up the equipment. Then we go to a material screen. So let's just show you quickly what the bag breaker looks like. And it does what it names says it does. So that it goes through this and rips the bags apart.
From there, it goes to a material screen. And what you're seeing here, this is like going uphill and cardboard will surf uphill. Heavier stuff will fall through the slots on this and we'll bail up the cardboard and see how that works. So we're separating out cardboard from the heavier stuff. From there, we go to an air separator, polishing screen. What it's doing is separating paper, cardboard, fibrous stuff in 2D from metal and containers with water in 3D. So we'll show you the metal separator first. Here's a typical metal separator. We have two, we have, uh, two metal types of metal separators. Did you know there's an ultra strong magnet here and pulling the metal out and uh, off the line. This first one is removing um, um, iron. And then from there, we also have what we call optical sorters. So they're set up for different types of commodities. We can program it. And once it, it infrared light notices or realizes that particular commodity is there, it hits it with a puff of air. So I'll show you a quick optical sorter. And so when it's recognized the material is looking for, it hits it a puff of air, and then it just shoots it off to a line so it can be bailed up. So now you have this different bail lines of plastic and paper and metal, for example. You have to polish them. You have to make sure they're ultra pure to get through into these Pacific Rim countries. So we either use people or we use a, ro a robot. Our robot is Max, and Max, in, in this case, Max is set up on our plastic line. And what it's doing, what, what he or she's doing is removing the non-plastic items. Check this out. And so it's, this is the plastic bottle line, and anything that's not the plastic model, it's programmed to remove it. And the more it picks, the better it becomes. It's about four times faster than human, and these bales are ultra pure. Here you go. This is beautiful stuff that then we sell on the markets, cans, and so on. So what isn't recycled at the material recovery facility, we landfill it. So we load that back into truck, transfer a truck, and below the Pointe Hills Murph are these different bays, and the trucks are loaded, and they go off to Orange County Landfill, where the stuff that isn't recycled um, gets um, landfilled there and these loads are covered up. You'll see that very soon before it heads out. In the material recovery facility, we're also doing food waste recycling. For anyone that lives in California, you're, you're probably aware of a law that was passed in 2016 called SB 1383. Um, the state of California is required that organic material be diverted from landfill because when it's buried in landfill, it'll generate methane, which is a greenhouse gas. Um, according to the state, it's 80 times more disruptive than CO2. So it passed a law in 2016 that requires all jurisdictions in the state of California to divert organic uh, waste from landfill. And the goal in, I mean, the goal now is 50% diversion from the standards from like 2014 and 75% reduction um, in, in by 2025. So we have the Pony Hills MRF is set up to help cities and a jurisdiction meet this organic recycling requirement. Because a big chunk of this organic waste is food waste. Roughly 50% of this organic waste is food waste. And in LA County, we throw out at least 4,000 tons of food waste a day. And we have the built-in infrastructure to help with that. We have the Pointe Hills MRF. And in Maria's portion, she talked about how we handle solids from wastewater treatment. We have anaerobic digester, and I'll just digress a little bit. The state either wants you, if it's food waste and it, or food and it's edible, donate as much as 20%. If you can't donate it, then you want to uh, compost it or put it in anaerobic digester. And I'll show you what one of those are, because those make sure that methane does not get to the atmosphere. Here's the program in, in nutshell. Food waste, unprocessed food waste will come into the Pointe Hills Murph. We also take it at our Shoal Canyon landfill. It'll be turned into what we call a slurry or a smoothie. 
then it's tracked, o- tracked over to our joint water pollution control plant in Carson that Maria showed you when she brought up that secondary slide. They have digesters there. And then those digesters will produce biogas that we'll use for fuel source. And then whatever is left over will return into compost and fertilizer. So here's Pointy Hills birth. Here's uh, source separated food waste. And even food waste from the grocery store or the restaurant has plastics or maybe plastic bag. So you can see it's not completely pure, but it's about 90% organic or food waste. It's put into this hopper. This hopper feeds it into these, these things called bioseparators, which are like motorized garlic presses. They have holes in them. They push out the organic material and keep the plastic, the stuff that doesn't break down. We have, we have two bioseparators with different hole or smaller hole. And here, this stuff gets landfill. And here's the stuff we want, this slurry, this smoothie that is pure energy, and we're gonna put it in the digester. And hopefully the person asked the question about how we handle solids, you'll see our digester. Here's our, the, what we call the DOTA system to handle the, the food waste. Then we'll have drivers that come to Pony Hills Murph, pump out the slurry into the tanker that you see here. And then they'll truck it right over to the Joint Water Pollution Control Plant in Carson. They're offloaded into the slurry receiving stations. And then from there, it's fed into these digesters that you see on the left. So we have about 24 digesters at the joint plant in Carson. That's where all the solids for the treatment plant down in this part of LA County are handled. Maria talked about how, and someone asked about what happens to solids processing at San Jose Creek. Well. All the solids that we take out of wastewater there, we put it back into the sewer with this wastewater that's too salty for reuse. And we do solids processing at one location at a huge cost saving. So in addition to the wastewater solid, we're now putting food waste with that. And it's bumping up the amount of gas we're producing. In about 15 or 16 days, these digesters set up just like our gut, same kind of microorganisms that would be in there. They reduce volume. They reduce odors. They give off this biogas that we harvest for energy. That energy goes to um, our total energy facility. Around the same time we were building the power plant at the landfill, we were building this at the joint plant Carson. It's a 20 megawatt power plant. It essentially makes the the joint plant um, energy self-sufficient. And when I say essentially, because there are times where the plant's down for repair, that may be 5% 5% or less of the time. And at those times, then you might have to flare it. But, but this is a great resource that we're now creating energy from it. And whatever we don't need, we're, we're using it for other things. So as we produce more gas with more food waste, we built an underground pipeline from the digesters. Notice the digesters here on the left. And we're taking it to an existing compressed natural gas fueling station we have at the corner of Sepulveda and Figueroa in the city of Carson, right across from the plant. Underground, that, that, that biogas, that digester gas is purified. It goes from like 60% methane to about 90% methane. It's stored here, and then we dispense it here. Here's a ground level shot of the biogas conditioning system. Here's the tank that stores this ultra pure methane. We dispense it here um, at existing fueling station. And we're looking to expand the fueling station because we're getting more gas from the food waste coming to the treatment plant. So in addition, so the Pointy Hills Murph delivers food waste slurry to the treatment plant, but other waste haulers can also bring it there. So we have about 250 tons on average of food waste slurry coming to the joint plant every day. Um, Our goal is to get up to about 600 tons per day of food waste slurry. And when we get there, we're gonna be producing the equivalent, the gasoline gallon equivalent, about 5,700 gallons of gasoline. And we get to that point, we're gonna take that biogas and we're gonna use it. We have a number of um, electric vehicle charging station. So some of that energy will go to EV charging stations at the plant in Carson. Some of that will go to vehicle fuel that I just showed you. And maybe down the road, we inject this into the natural gas pipeline. So that's kind of um, 
that's a, a quick overview of the our solid waste uh, management or our, what occurs in terms of our Pointe Hills landfill and Pointe Hills material recovery facility. At that point, I'm going to stop sharing and take questions. Hopefully, they're questions and they're easier than what Maria got. I well, let's see. Um... First of all, we had a comment from Kay Hamilton that says, I love the use of automation. This is fascinating. So, thank you. Yeah, it has helped us, especially the MAX um, um, program that that sorter. Um, it's made the, uh, um, the numbers are like mind boggling. Before like paper bales might've been 54% pure. Now they're like 95% pure, for example because that thing is just picking away like crazy or plastic went from like, or like 85% pure bales, so. Yeah, all right. So just a reminder, if you guys have any questions, please use the Q&A feature. It's at the bottom of your screen or you can use the raise hand feature and we'll call on you so you can ask your question live and have a, can follow up on the spot. Um, okay, so the, are landfills, all right, so this is a good one. So aren't landfills detrimental to the environment? What effects would you expect landfills to have on the earth in the distant future? Um, you know, we're, we try to recycle. That's just, just uh, our focus is it really the material recovery facilities. Um, so as much as we should, Everyone in the district, we believe that you should think in terms of when you buy something, what are you going to do with it when it's done? But our task is to make sure we help whatever people um, get rid of. But and what we we created the modern metropolitan landfill before we got into the landfilling game. Landfills were literally dumps. I mean, we put in the liner system, the gas collection system, the that biogas, the the power plant. Back in the days, and I wasn't there back in the days, I hear that a lot of the mucky mucks in, in the private sector and in the state were like, dang, I wish we did this first. And so we're working with what we got. And I think that the more we can recycle better. And that's why the Point of Hills material recoveries facility is there. It's set up and it could be, if, if we find something that has a value and we have a home for it, side landfill, we can reconfigure that thing to, to recycle that material, so. We changed the landfill game for good. Yeah. All right. So, um, so can the sorting line discern between recyclable and non-recyclable materials? Yes. Um, so, so like, so there are a couple of things. There's the optical separator that is programmed for like different commodities, and once it sees it, it hits it like infrared light. Then it hit it with a puff of air, and then what's not valuable or recyclable, it won't push it off the line. And as well as the, the robot, Max is programmed to discern the difference. Okay, perfect. So next question. Um, what is the net energy gain considering all the energy that is used up until the end? The transport of slurry, the 97 degree um, digester, etc. Um. Okay, that's a good question. I know overall, um, the, 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 the joint plant produces about 20 megawatts at least. Um, per got the landfill prints another 20 megawatts. And overall, I think district wide with our different energy production facility, we're in like 76 or 77 megawatts of energy. Um, and what I would say is that that methane would be there from the wastewater treatment process. If we're not recycling it and it's buried in a landfill, especially organic waste, that methane would be there. And that methane has to be captured and destroyed. And if you can capture and destroy it and generate power, that's a win-win. So, um, and I know in terms of our operation, and I'm trying to, for like the joint plant, that energy production saves us at least $9 million a year in terms of energy purchases. So that kind of gives you a ballpark that that makes sense. You know, you wouldn't be doing it if it's costing you more money because the ratepayers are paying for that. 
Okay, and the next question, are we supposed to put all of our food waste into the green bin? That's a good question. It's really a function of who your waste hauler is. They, they've, and your city. So you, every city in California has to comply by, with this law starting January of this year. So it depends on what program your cities can come, come up with. And so our, our material recovery facility is designed to handle food waste with green waste, provided the food waste is in um, a bag so we can pull it apart from the green waste. But it's really a function of who your particular hauler and city is. But you know, tell them we have room at the end. It won't be there forever, but we have room at, and we have the already existing infrastructure to help you and your city comply, including school districts have to do the same thing. You know, if they have food from the cafeteria, if they can donate it, do it. If not, then they got to compost it or put it in a digester. And we have a bunch of them. Perfect. Yeah. And I think the key is that every city is different. We have another question here that says, our trash and recycling company trucks offer uh, to dump both our residential and trash recycle bins into one same truck. So they're not recycling properly. Does that matter now with your separation facility that separates the trash bags from recycling? I mean, we're California, um, we have um, standards that we have to hit with recycling. I think a lot of during the pandemic and what was happening in China, some haulers were making the decision that um, they were going to just commingle it. But I can't speak for exactly what they're doing. But we're here to help our cities. You know, the cities that Maria talked about, there are 78 cities in LA County that sit on our board of directors. And we're here to help them meet these different state uh, laws. Um, you know, either food waste recycling or recycling in general. So we're here to help our member city. Yeah. Um, okay, so another question. Does this facility process the waste collected by Athens? Um, yes, I think Athens um, brings some facility. They're close by where the Pony Hills Murph is at. Um, it's at the 605 and the 60, much, and it's also where the um, San Jose Creek Water Reclamation Plant's at. But Athens, I think, is on Valley. They have at least have a facility in Valley. So, you know, historically, you know, they can take it to their own facility or they can bring it to, but um, on one of our facilities, it's a choice they make. We turn no one away. Bring trash, pay, we're good. <laughs> or recycle material. Yeah. Pay, and we're good. Yeah. All right. So um, can you give us some examples of materials that cannot be recycled? Wow, um, materials that cannot be recycled. Um, I mean, I know what we do recycle. We recycle paper, cardboard, plastic, metals. Um, those are things that, you know, we're just, if, if I, I guess it's really what is the commodity market as well as food waste. So those, and even the green waste, we will take that and we will um, take that off site um, work with someone who will take it offsite, compost it, and use it. So those are the things that I know we're we're um, pulling out or recycling in town. Okay, cool. So, um, next question: E-waste is a major concern for waste management facilities worldwide. How does e-waste factor into the MRF? There are other countries that extract precious materials such as gold from their e-waste. So. Part of the thing Genesis talked about our household hazardous waste program, a big component of that is to take e-waste and we work with different companies that environment, that recycle it environmentally. We don't want to hear that it winds up in some country where some kids playing in a stack of this material. So the companies we deal with, and I don't know them off the top of the head, we ensure that they're complying with you know, the environmental regulations um, and that they recycle and, and it's not, you know, yeah. Yeah, so the folks, this, if e-waste comes into our facility, it's properly disposed of and we make sure it doesn't get exported and become someone else's headache. And I don't know if Genesis, you remember what percentage the e-waste gets recycled? I know it's at least 80%. It was that 80 was my number, yeah. Yeah. 80 was my number. Okay, and don't forget, 
if you guys still have any questions about the San Jose Creek water reclamation plant tour where we convert sewage into clean water, recycled water, please put those questions in the chat and we'll address them right after these. Um, or even now, if they want to do it. Even now, yeah. I mean, I have, yeah. yeah. All right. So another question, um, what do the Pacific Rim countries do with the recycled materials? I think, you mean that they generate, I think they're doing the same that thing. we send. Oh, that we so send. they usually turn it into a commodity. Um, they um, either turn it into a paper or uh, reuse it again. That's, that's why, especially China is cracking down. They don't want it just piling up in the countryside. So they're really toughening the standard. I think it's important. I think someone asked the question before. I think it's incumbent in all of us to play a part in like closing the loop. You know, think about, okay, can I buy something that can be recycled? What's gonna happen with it when I'm done with it? Yeah. So. All right, so next question. Are food cartons with liners recyclable like styrofoam cups and other food containers? I'm, I don't think so, but I could, I could, um, I'm not a hundred percent sure. Uh, I, I, um, food cartons with, with liners in, in it. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure I could, I could get an answer. The next question, how are the workers at the MRF protected? So we have a health and safety group and, um, we, we comply with all the OSHA requirements and, um, you know, so we yeah we're following all the OSHA requirements and yeah, and to make sure everyone is 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 safe. All right, awesome. So now a few questions regarding the recycled water portion of this tour, this tri triple tour as Maria called it. Um, do you have specific testing and removal processes for PFAS and pharmaceuticals in the water? Specific testing. Um, again, I can, I know we are, we are sampling, we have extensive, we have, um, we're really um, sampling and testing for, there's, there's a lot of PFAS, or did you say PFAS? Yeah. There's, well, PFAS, um, there's a, these chemicals, there's so many of these, for, or these chemicals they call forever chemicals, but we have a working group that's analyzing these chemicals, looking to see their sources, I mean, what we find is that they're ubiquitous. They're they're everywhere, and they just happen to, you know, our our wastewater treatment plant. I guess I've heard that most of us have some PFAS in our body, so we're 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 analyzing sources of PFAS, like what industries discharge. We're looking in our wastewater, and we're meeting regularly to understand the ramifications of this and see what we have to do moving forward. It's an ever involved, evolving area of um, knowledge. Um, and it's something that we have our, our laboratory folks, our engineering folks, our legislative folks, we meet periodically and we look at the data. We have our industrial waste folks. So it's something that most people aren't aware of, but it's, um, I tell my own, my own mom not to use this because it, ha it, it generates PFAS. And I think it's something, again, we all have to play a part in addressing this. And we're studying this and figuring out what role and how we can help. All right. Thank you. So still on the wastewater question side, um, are the ducks impacted by hanging out in the treatment plant? Ducks are pretty smart. They know the, where the clean water is at. You know, they're never in the, yeah, no, they're, they're not. Um, the ducks aren't, the water is pretty clean at that point. It's very clean at that point. All right, and then do the districts <coughs> offer any guidance on creating gray water systems in private homes? Um, I don't have any guidance on that. I think that's where you would talk to your local city and jurisdiction. All right, perfect. So right now I am putting in the chat the link so that you guys can visit our HHW page, the Household Hazardous Waste and E-Waste uh, collection event page so that you can see when the next event in your area is. And then, sorry, were you gonna say something? Um, I just say the questions I couldn't answer if, um, if uh, folks could um, either give them my email address or 
so then we could follow up with an answer. There are a couple of questions I really didn't want to just guess at the answer. All right, um, so I will put that here too. Uh, please email us at info at lacsd.org. That'll go to Basil, that'll go to me, that'll go to Maria. So we can all see it as it comes in and we can respond to you. Um, all right, so we have a last question here. Um, just came in. How does the how do the machines distinguish between the different types of plastics? Um, so there's an infrared light, and I'm not sure of the program that goes in there, but it it um, the infrared light um, can distinguish ways program. And I guess it may be something that happens. What happens when the light hits different types of plastic? I don't know, if Genesis, if you know the specifics from talking to some of the folks that built the system. And then once they recognize, they hit it with a puff of air. But it's something where the infrared light, um, I guess, gives off a different. I'm not sure. I like the thickness. Is that what it the is? Thickness level. Yeah, that's is, what I. Yeah. Is that what you? Yeah, because it's pretty. Yeah, the infrared different. light hits it and every type of plastic has a different thickness. And that's how it gets also pre-sorted. Also with the heavier types of plastic, like the jugs that also gets pre-sorted i forgot the name of the machine but some are kind of like surf through the top um the material um, separator i think the one yeah, we're like, surfing up top yeah like the milk jugs and the or air separator where you're using density to separate them across there yeah. you go it, yeah um anyway if you guys have any additional questions or you want to follow up with anything please email us at info at lacsd.org we can put you in contact with um our other colleagues at work um, at either the water reclamation plants or the materials recovery facility slash landfill. And well, thank you guys so, so much. We hope you enjoyed it. There was someone in the comments that says she keeps coming back. It's not her first time joining a tour. So I'm very flattered. We're very flattered. Thank you so much. And again, please reach out to us if anything else comes up later in the day and enjoy your weekend. And wait, sorry, wait. And if you want to check out our other tours, uh, we have our ocean monitoring one coming up. Please visit lacsd.org slash tours and you'll get the full schedule for the year. And that's okay. really a fascinating tour. You, you the get the ocean monitoring life. tour is awesome. You guys yeah. are going to like it. If you guys and you like, won't get seasick. If you liked this one, you'll love that one and you won't get seasick. Yeah, so bring your flippers and we'll see you on July 16. And please visit that website for more details. Thank you and have a good one. Bye. Bye-bye.